Hi, everyone. My name is Marisa Narash. I am part of the OBGYN department here and the director of our Women's Option Service. And so I'm excited to be here today to talk to you a little bit about early pregnancy management, but also to talk about what our services are in terms of women's options here at Jacoby and how we're structured and how you refer to us. And hopefully, if you have any questions um, or want to bring anything up, just have some direct communication with you. So um, that's a big reason why I wanted to come today. So I'm going to talk a little bit about early pregnancy and what the possibilities are, what the counseling and management options are, and then what is the organization of our services here at Jacoby and how do they work. So in terms of early pregnancy options, there are really four things that can occur, right? You can have a viable intrauterine pregnancy. You can have an early pregnancy failure. You can have a pregnancy of unknown location. And then you can have an ectopic pregnancy. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about each of those and my understanding of how that would be managed between the two services um, in the ER and then with the GYN service. Um, and. Uh, sort of how we should be counseling patients as well. So for viable intrauterine pregnancy, it's simple. For viable intrauterine pregnancy and for ectopic pregnancy, it's really pretty straightforward, right? Viable intrauterine pregnancy, the main question is, is this a desired pregnancy or not? If it's a desired pregnancy, the patient is going to be referred for an OB intake visit. And if it's not a desired pregnancy, they're going to be referred to the Women's Options Clinic for management of undesired pregnancy for termination. So I think this is the most straightforward one of all, probably. But the next one is early pregnancy failure. And when we talk about early pregnancy failure, the management is a little bit more complex. So how do we diagnose early pregnancy failure? Anyone? What do we do? We get Beautiful. Yes. And to diagnose a failure, it's really going to be ultrasound criteria that are going to tell you if it's a failed pregnancy or not, right? Um, and remember when the guidelines are created for early pregnancy failure, they're based on the assumption that it's a highly desired pregnancy and that the patient wants 100% specificity in that diagnosis. They want to be completely sure that it's failed and there's no chance <laughs> that it's actually a viable pregnancy. Now, the reality is that that's not always the case and we have to take it within the clinical context. So the guidelines are incredibly conservative. So when we're talking about you know, an empty sac, an anembryonic pregnancy, um, to achieve 100% specificity, you need a mean sac diameter of 21 millimeters. And actually, the latest guidelines say to use a cutoff of 25 millimeters to account for additional error that could happen, error in the measurement, et cetera. So it uses a very, very conservative measure. Um, and likewise, when you talk about actually seeing an embryo and not seeing a fetal heart rate, uh, the um, the specificity of 100% comes with a measurement of at least 5.3 millimeters in terms of the length of the crown rump. Um, but, you know, that again, we're talking about 100% specificity. But um, if you look at uh, where we exceed 90% specificity, it's a mean sac diameter of 16 millimeters or um, a crown rump length of 5 millimeters. So, in terms of counseling, and I'm going to talk about this a little more, we know that patients want realistic counseling and they want appropriate follow-up. And so um, it's, I think it's really important to you know, not give false hope, obviously, when we counsel patients, um, to be direct about what our findings are and what we suspect is going on, even if we haven't made a definitive diagnosis, and to make the appropriate referral. <coughs> Other options in terms of early pregnancy failure, if it's not an anembryonic pregnancy and it's not an embryonic demise, of course you might be diagnosing a completed spontaneous abortion, an incomplete spontaneous abortion, an inevitable abortion. And all of those are going to require management as well. So the question is really with early pregnancy failure, what are the options? And then what are our personal biases? Because they strongly impact the way that we counsel patients in this setting. and then. What does the data say that patients want? So 
When we look at the decision making around early pregnancy failure for patients, we know that number one, patients want options. Like one of the things about early pregnancy failure is that it's something that feels very out of control for patients and having options and knowing that they get some say in how this plays out is extremely helpful to patients. So they want to know what their options are. Um, patients express a lot of frustration around an ambiguous or delayed news delivery. So they want they want us to be candid with our counseling and realistic about the expectations so that they can be realistic and really process what's going on. And then also, each patient has their own personal priorities. So, you know, what is most important to an, any given patient obviously is not the same um, and may not be the same as for us. So, again, like we were talking about, the, you know, how certain is the diagnosis? To us, maybe that seems like of the utmost importance, but I think patients are weighing many factors when they're making their decisions. So this was a study looking at um, provider preferences, essentially, and how it impacts the way that we counsel patients. So they looked at different types of providers and found that OBGYNs primarily recommended DNC. OBGYNs love to intervene, right? We're surgeons. On the other hand, when they looked at midwives and family practice physicians, they were, um, they much more tended to expectant management. So, you know, allowing the natural process to occur. So our, our counseling and our recommendations are incredibly biased based on, you know, our personal preferences and our skill set as well, I think. So when we're talking about early pregnancy failure, we have three options, right? We have the option of expectant management, we have the option of medical management, and we have the option of surgical management. So in terms of expectant management, the success rates are really variable, um, and they depend on the size of the pregnancy, they depend on the interval of time that the pregnancy has already been failed and intrauterine. Um, so you can see, <laughs> expulsion rates in the literature anywhere from 25 to 80 percent. And women's choices around expectant management often are based on what their other options are. So what are the other services that we can offer? What is the time frame of the other options? And then that really factors into whether women want to choose expectant management or not. But in general, about 50% of women will initially choose expectant management in the setting of an early pregnancy failure. And we see the highest success rates for expectant management when the process has already started, when it's an incomplete abortion as opposed to a missed abortion where you know, the entire pregnancy is still inside. Um, and as you might imagine, the less tissue that's still present, the more likely it is that, they're gonna be, that it's gonna be successful in terms of passing the last bit of tissue. So if people don't want expectant management, then the other two options are medical and surgical management. Um, and I think that often women really do need some help in deciding between the two. And I don't know if you find this, but I find that often women just say, well, what do you think is better? Um, which one is safer? And the reality is that the risks for both are incredibly low. And it really is a lot about the patient's preferences. And the experience is so different between having, a, having surgical and medical management and which one is going to be her preference. So why do you think women might choose medical management? Like, what are the biggest reasons that they choose medical management in your experience? What was that? Yeah, exactly. So to avoid a procedure or anesthesia, um, that's a big reason that people might, might not want that. The medical? Yeah, so it, the timing of it. So oftentimes they can get the medicine at the moment that they're diagnosed and they don't need to wait for an additional appointment. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Yeah, they can do it at home. So privacy. It feels much more private to some patients to be able to do medical management because they go home. It's a process that occurs in their home and hopefully most of the time they don't have to necessarily come back. Absolutely. And some people also describe it as feeling more natural, right? That it feels much less interventional to them than a procedure and more a part of the natural process that maybe we're just encouraging. 
So how do we do it? What is our medical management? What do we give them? Hmm? Side attack, how much? Anyone? What did you just say? Sorry, I couldn't hear you. Yeah. So a pretty good standard is 800 micrograms buccal or vaginal. It's a single dose, but you can give an additional dose. So although you don't have to give an additional dose, as we're saying, the success rate is variable, and oftentimes an additional dose is needed. So mesoprostol, 800 micrograms buccal or vaginal, they follow up in a few days. If they need an additional dose, we're able to give them an additional dose, OK? Um, there is a, some research being done looking at whether, even in the setting of a pregnancy failure, whether we should be giving mifepristone in addition to the mesoprostol, which is the regimen we use for medication abortion. So if someone has a viable pregnancy and wants to terminate, and they're less than 10 weeks, they have the option of doing it medically as opposed to surgically. And in that setting, we give mifepristone, and then 24 to 48 hours later, we give the mesoprostol. And we find that the mifepristone kind of primes their uterus and their cervix, and the mesoprostol is more effective. And so the combination is more effective than mesoprostol alone. Um, and I think that it very well may be coming in the future that we're going to give the combination to everyone, even in the setting of an early pregnancy failure. But Right now, it's not, I wouldn't say it's the standard yet. We still just give mesoprostol in the setting of early pregnancy failure. So methotrexate is not um, recommended management for pregnancy failure or for medication abortion. It's something that is used in countries where mesoprostol is not necessarily available, but the efficacy is less. So in this setting, we shouldn't be using methotrexate for a pregnancy failure. Obviously, we use it for ectopic pregnancy, but not if it's an intrauterine pregnancy failure. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> Agreed. There are actually a lot of studies done around dosing of mesoprostol, um, and a lot of the studies are done in re in relation to medication abortion again, so in the setting of a viable pregnancy. But in that setting, we actually have quite good data that 800 micrograms is the dose to give. Um, in the setting of pregnancy failure, uh, the data is a little more variable. But I think because we know so well in the setting of medication abortion that it's 800, more and more people are doing 800. And I think you'll find that the people that use alternative doses um, maybe trained a little bit longer ago than the ones that use 800. And it's becoming more and more uniform at this point. There aren't a lot of contraindications to medical management. Mainly, the contraindications are around concern for bleeding. Um, and so any kind of hemorrhagic disorder, or if they're on anticoagulation, you don't want to manage them medically. And it would be the same thing in terms of just of terminating a pregnancy. We wouldn't want to offer medical, medical abortion if someone has a bleeding disorder. Um, if they're hemodynamically unstable, obviously we need to proceed with surgical management. Um, if they have an IUD in place, we need to take out the IUD. And then at that point, they could choose medical management or surgical management. If they have an allergy to mesoprostol, which is incredibly rare because it's a prostaglandin, which is naturally found in our bodies. Um, if they have a pelvic infection or if they have a molar pregnancy. So in terms of the appropriate gestational age range for medical management, um, as I said, for medication abortion, we'll do it up to 10 weeks. And so the same is roughly true in terms of medical management of a pregnancy failure. Um, the reason that we don't like to go greater than 10 weeks is actually mainly around risk of bleeding. Larger pregnancy, higher risk of bleeding. They're going to be at home doing this process, and so we don't necessarily want to risk them um, hemorrhaging. So in general, we say up to 10 weeks, it's an option for a patient. <clears throat> 
It's based on the sonographic measurement. It's based on a crown rump length. So, you know, the measurement of a sac, the, you know, although they will give a gestational age based on the mean sac diameter, um, you know, that's only mildly helpful. Um, but in terms of the crown rump length, it would be the size that I'm, that I'm referring to. Yeah. Um, and as you can see, it's not as effective. Medical management for a pregnancy failure is not as effective as medication abortion. Um, and you know, that's part of the reason why people are looking into, like, is it the mifepristone that improves that efficacy? Or is it something about the fact that it's a pregnancy failure? That these are the, the patients that are getting medical management are the ones that have a pregnancy failure and didn't pass it spontaneously. And so maybe there's some reason why they didn't pass it spontaneously. And so it's harder to. Um, to empty out the uterine cavity. So in terms of counseling, uh, essentially we want to counsel the patient about what to expect. So how long does it take? After they take the mesoprostol, usually the bleeding and crampies, cramping starts between one and six hours after taking the dose. And the final passage of the tissue can be delayed for up to a week. Usually they're going to have the heavy bleeding with clots for a few hours and then lighter bleeding like a period that ultimately becomes spotting that they could have for even a few weeks. They're going to have strong cramping, but we always give them NSAIDs to take. And they can have nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Those are common side effects from mesoprostol. They also can have a fever from mesoprostol, but we generally tell them that as the side effect from mesoprostol shouldn't last more than 24 hours. So if they're still having a fever the next day after taking mesoprostol, you know, they need to, they need to call us and have a suspicion for infection. Did someone have a question? It's a great question. NSAIDs usually are sufficient, are sufficient for the pain control. They're quite effective. Um, so usually what I tell people is this should work. We usually give them 800 milligrams of ibuprofen to take, you know, Q6 to 8 hours. Um, if it doesn't work, then call us because it works the vast majority of the time. Like, most people do not end up calling us regarding pain. So if they do, it's unusual. In terms of complications, the complications from both medical and surgical management are very rare. As you can see, you know, mainly we're talking about risk of hemorrhage and risk of infection. Um, we do see a difference in terms of blood loss between medical and surgical management. But if you look at the transfusion rate, the, which is the second line there, the risk of transfusion is incredibly low with both options. So even though there is a larger blood loss with medical management as opposed to surgical, it's not necessarily clinically significant most of the time. Um, also, you see the down at the bottom, called the doctor. <laughs> Um, that's higher with medical management, which is logical. So patients are at home, they're going through a process that takes a lot longer than surgical management, and they have concerns and they get worried and they need to have a number to call. So I'm going to keep going because we already talked about this. That's just when we tell them to call us. In terms of surgical management, we're talking about a dilation and curatage. That can be done with a manual vacuum aspiration or an electric vacuum aspiration. And it can be done with local anesthesia or with sedation and general sedation slash general anesthesia. Um, the, dis the decision around local versus sedation is really mostly the patient's decision. And again, it's around patient preference. Most of our patients do choose to have sedation, but we do have patients that choose to do it under local anesthesia. Either because they want to do it the same day, they haven't been NPO, for example, or they don't have an escort to come with them because if they're going to have it with sedation, they need an escort. Um, so there are a few different reasons why they may choose one versus the other. So in terms of the emergency room, um, I think that you guys assess their stability. You can discuss the options with them. And then you decide what do they need. If they need urgent medical or surgical management, I presume you're going to call GYN for a consult for that. Is that accurate? Yes. 
Um, if they don't need urgent management, then they can be scheduled in the women's options clinic. So if they're choosing expectant management, then they can come back f the following week. I usually don't schedule people more than a week out, even if they want expectant management, because people's choices change after they wait a little bit of time if nothing happens. Um, also, the chance of them passing the pregnancy spontaneously decreases as more time passes. Um, if they want medical or surgical management, then it makes sense to have them follow up in one to two days. What do you guys think of this slide? Do you think this makes sense? Yeah. Okay. Yes, so I'm going to tell you at the end about the services and how to refer them to us. But overall, I would say, although it's not walk-in, it is easy. We have appointments within one to two days, basically all the time. The third category is the pregnancy of unknown location. So pregnancy of unknown location is where we don't visualize an intra or extra uterine pregnancy, and the patient has a positive pregnancy test. A third of the time, that will become a visualized intrauterine pregnancy. 10% of the time, that will end up being a visualized ectopic pregnancy. And the rest of the time, it'll either spontaneously resolve without us ever seeing the pregnancy, or it won't resolve, and then we'll either intervene, you know, based on what we think is most likely, either with the DNC or with um, management of an ectopic pregnancy. So in terms of the important questions to ask and the tests to get with a pregnancy of unknown location, the first question is just, how is the patient doing? So obviously, we're going to look at their vitals, we're going to look at their CBC, and we're going to assess them. Second question is, what do you expect to see, right? As you're ordering a beta HCG and you're ordering an ultrasound, the question is, what do we think is going to happen, right? When was their last pregnancy? When was their um, last menstrual period? If it was less than four weeks ago, we don't expect to see anything. We expect their beta HCG to be low. Um, when was their last episode of unprotected intercourse? Um, if they had uh, assisted reproduction, then what day was the what day was the fertilization? And then what is their HCG level? Thirdly, what is your concern for ectopic pregnancy? So do they have any risk factors for ectopic pregnancy? Do they have any ultrasound findings concerning? And do they have any symptoms? If a patient has no pain and no bleeding and has a positive pregnancy test and we don't see the pregnancy, we generally don't follow them closely for rule out ectopic. We follow them for rule out ectopic if they have something that concerns us. If they present with any bleeding, if they present with any pain, then yes we follow them on our beta list. But if they don't have any of those symptoms, lots of people have early pregnancies, obviously, um, and we follow them up maybe in about a week with a follow-up ultrasound. And then last question is, is this a desired pregnancy? The reason that matters is because if it's not a desired pregnancy, you don't need the same level of diagnosis to do a DNC, right? It can be a pregnancy of unknown location, and you can do a DNC that's actually going to be diagnostic as well as therapeutic. So a beta HCG does not help us distinguish between a normal and failed intrauterine pregnancy. Once we diagnose an intrauterine pregnancy, a beta HCG should not be checked again. It's of no use. The follow-up is with an ultrasound. But when do we use beta HCGs? We use them to diagnose pregnancy sometimes. We use them to follow up pregnancies of unknown location to determine is it rising appropriately, is it stagnant, or is it decreasing. We use them to follow up on resolution of an ectopic pregnancy. So if we treat someone with methotrexate, we follow their beta HCG all the way down to zero um, to be sure that the ectopic really was treated appropriately. And we use it to follow the resolution of a molar pregnancy. Actually, for 6 to 12 months, we follow the beta HCGs. In terms of ultrasound diagnosis, as I'm saying, it's a balance between sensitivity and specificity. So the guidelines assume that a patient wants 100% certainty of non-viability. But if it's undesired, you don't need that level of certainty to, to perform a DNC on a patient. That you only need that level of certainty if they want to keep a viable pregnancy. 
And if there are other competing factors, like if you have a concern about their stability or other things, then obviously the level of certainty may vary in terms of the threshold for, perf for performing an intervention. So that just means that you know, the ultrasound is just, an, it's just a test, um, and the ultrasound report is just a report. And it's for you and for us to interpret it in the entire context of the patient and what her, um, you know, what her uh, clinical picture is and what her desires are. So pregnancy of unknown location, if there's a concern for ectopic pregnancy, call us. Um, and if there are no concerns for ectopic pregnancy, and it may just be an early pregnancy, they should just follow up in our GYN clinic. And then the last option, ectopic pregnancy, call us. So our women's option services at um, Jacoby Medical Center. So we're a team of providers and staff who work to ensure that our patients have access to full spectrum reproductive health services, including contraception and abortion services. We're a team of doctors, PAs, midwives, nurses, and clerical staff that all work together. So what do we do in women's options as opposed to the rest of GYN? So we manage early pregnancy failure, both medical and surgical management. Um, in terms of pregnancy of unknown location, for patients that need a diagnostic DNC, uh, that usually happens in women's options clinics. So for our patients, even if they're being followed on the beta list, if, they, um, if we're at the point where they th we think they need a diagnostic DNC, they get set up to see us in women's options clinic. Um, we care for everyone who wants a termination of pregnancy and we do medical abortion up to 10 weeks gestation. We do surgical abortion up to 20 weeks gestation and beyond 20 weeks we refer them to NCB. And it's our same group actually that covers at NCB but in, at NCB we do it in the main OR and so we, um, we go beyond 20 weeks at NCB. And then we also offer full spectrum uh, contraceptive services at the time of pregnancy termination, including implant insertion and IUD insertion. So our women's options clinic is in building a third floor in 3A. Uh, the clinic is open Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and that's the time that we do intake. So we see all new patients who haven't been seen by us yet. We do medical management of pregnancy failure or of undesired pregnancy. And we also do office DNCs with local anesthesia on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And then our ambulatory surgery option is 11 West, so in building one, 11th floor. And that is every Thursday. We have an anesthesiologist with us. We do only procedures, it's not clinic visits. So we do DNCs and DNEs with deep sedation. And we do it up to 20 weeks gestation, as I was saying. So how do you refer a patient? So this is the phone number for the Women's Options Clinic. 7980 is our extension. So Monday through Friday, someone will answer that between 8 and 4, and you can schedule an appointment. After hours or on weekends, you can email for an appointment. And this is um, a newly made distribution list for people that need to contact our team. So this includes a few doctors, a few nurses, and also clerical staff. So you can use it to um, schedule an appointment. And you can also use it if you have a clinical question. Now, it's not going to be answered immediately. So a lot of your clinical questions you're going to page GYN for. But if you wanted to email us with a question, please feel free to. Okay. And then please feel free to reach out to me anytime. That's my email address. And I would love to hear from you guys. And that's it. <laughs> Questions? So yeah. That's a great question. I can tell you the GYN perspective, and maybe there's a different perspective from the emergency room leadership. But from our perspective, as I was saying, not everyone with a non-visualized intrauterine pregnancy is someone that we follow for rule out ectopic. We follow people for rule out ectopic if there's some concern for an ectopic. So if they have any pain or any bleeding and we can't see the pregnancy, then yes, we're going to follow them. Um, or if they or if there's something else about their clinical picture that makes you worried. But generally, for someone who's completely asymptomatic and is found to be pregnant, um, we don't 
follow them on the beta list for rheologic topic. We just set them, schedule them for an ultrasound whenever that, you know, in the next one to two weeks. In fact, most people who come into our clinic for a new prenatal visit don't have an identified intrauterine pregnancy and don't get an ultrasound the same day. Um, if they're asymptomatic, then they just get scheduled routinely for an ultrasound sometime in the first trimester. So I guess I would just say to keep that in mind, you know, that we don't scan everyone immediately when we find out they're pregnant, um, but we do if we have any concern for ectopic. What else? Okay. Thank you guys so much for all of the women's health work that you do. <laughs> because sometimes I think that you're like 50% women's health in the emergency room at least. So thank you and please reach out to me anytime.